Morning, everybody. Good to be back with y'all in the house of the Lord this morning. Y'all stay, and we're going to sing our song of the month, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. Y'all can be seated. Good morning. We're looking at uh, Mark chapter 14 this morning. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 12. The Bible says, And the first day of, un of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare? that thou mayest eat the Passover. And he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there, sh there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him, and wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the, to the good man of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished, and prepared, there make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Looking down at verse 22, And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. 
And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said, and he said unto them, This is my body of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, the privilege that it is to be here. We thank you for all those who have found it important to be here this morning. We thank you for those who are uh, watching or listening elsewhere. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless all of those who are meeting together for their efforts to be here, Lord. I pray that you would bless in the preaching and in the singing. I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds and allow us to receive what you have for us, Lord. Again, we thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you guys can go ahead and stand back up, and we're going to sing uh, How Great Thou Art in the Old Rugged Cross. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed and sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, and when I think that God is son not sparing, send him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on that cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Listen to that chorus one more time. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till 
of my trophies at last I'll lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown oh the old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction to me for the dear lamb of god left his glory above to bear it to dark calvary so i cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down i will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown in the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty i see for it was on that old cross jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish that old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Thank you, Alcmi Thank you, Landon. It's good to see you here this morning. Good to have Landon back with us. He was away last week at a camp uh, down in Georgia, helping a uh, retreat down in Georgia. As I mentioned to you last week, he came back and told us about how they had no heat at that camp, uh, and they were sleeping in 15 degrees. Well, not well, I guess it wasn't 15 degrees in the cabin. He said it felt about like that, but uh, I watched some of the video, and they were all in their hats and jackets and everything, even leading the worship, but had a wonderful experience down there, but we're glad to have him back here with us. Open your Bibles again to Mark 14, and I'm going to read this passage again. Thank you, Mark, for reading it. I like the word to sit on us and to begin to soak in from the very beginning. That's why we do that, but I want to read it again to you, but welcome. Make yourselves at home and just, I've got so much that I want to get to today. I've been really focusing this year on trying to be not as long, and I'm going to do my best this morning. Um, but I've got, as I was studying this passage, I just got so excited, and God showed me so much. And I hope that you get as excited as I do about what I'm about to share with you, about something as simple and perhaps familiar to us as the Lord's Supper. Uh, communion, uh, the Eucharist, as it is called. And so I want to share that with you, this passage with you, and I want you to see three things that I saw very clearly, three major points that I saw very clearly, and hopefully we'll get through all three this morning in this passage. But before we read it again, hold your copy of the Word of God up and say along with me, this is the Word of God. I will read it, I will believe it, and I will obey it by the grace of God. Let's begin reading again in verse 12 of chapter 14. And the first day of unleavened bread, this, this would be on Thursday, and of course we're leading to his arrest and then crucifixion, resurrection, but we still have more to go. But on that first day of the unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples, being Jesus' disciples, said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, 
Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him, and wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found, as he said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Then skip down to verse 22. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. I want to bring you this message. I'm entitled this, The Instituting of a New Supper. The Instituting of a New Supper. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would be with us today. God, that you would speak to us. God, that you would hide me behind your cross and help the message that you put in my heart for you to come out and for you to speak clearly to your people. God, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would fill us with the excitement of knowing that we have you in us, but also knowing what you did for us. And God, knowing what you have for us today. And God, I just pray that you would be with us to hear clearly and to obey clearly just as these disciples did. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This, of course, is the account, or at least the, according to the Gospel of Mark, of Christ's last celebration or his what we call the Last Supper. Uh, it was the last Passover that Christ participated in on the earth. It's known in some circles or some churches as the Eucharist. Uh, we more commonly in the Baptist church call it the Lord's Supper or communion. But either way, it's the same thing. It's what he was doing here. He was taking something that was an old tradition and he was making something new out of it. And so therefore instituted a new Supper, the Lord's Supper, communion, the Eucharist. And so I want you to see three points, as I said this morning, that what we can learn from this passage, there's more than that, but I mean three major things that I see in this passage and I want you to see. And the first two are really kind of an introduction, and then we're going to get down actually into this new supper. But I want you to see number one, first and foremost, I want you to see something that may shock you. God always makes his will, his way clear to those who are paying attention. I don't know if you're like me, but there's times that I struggle with knowing what God's will is. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or nod your head or anything else. But if you're being honest, there's times that, God, I just want to know what your will is, and I'm having a hard time understanding or knowing exactly what it is that you want me to do today or this year or in my life or whatever it may be. But I want you to know that God makes it clear. He's not hiding it from you. He's not, trying, he's not like a, you know, toying with a cat with a little ball of string or, or whatever it might be, with a little mouse and kind of laser pointer and, you know, follow this and chase that. And now where am I going? And what is, no, that's not the way he works. As I've said it many times before, I don't think he says to us, I have a will for you. <laughs> Figure out what it is. That's not what he does. And in this passage, we see it very clear that he laid out exactly what he wanted his disciples to do. Now, before we get to that, let me just say this. There's a reason or there are reasons why we struggle to know his will and his way for us. We don't like to talk about it sometimes. Obviously, sin and sin nature certainly in our lives keeps us from knowing God's will or following God's will or determining what God's will is or deciphering it, if you will, or seeing it, but it's meant to be seen clearly, and I want you to see that right here. But 
certainly we deal with sin, but there are things, and really they are sins, but our fears get in the way of us knowing what God's will is. In other words, we think we might know what it is, but the fear creeps in and we say, well, I don't think that can be it because I'm afraid to do that. Or I don't know that I can do that. Or I, I, I don't know God's gift to me in that area. But God's will, if he's called you to it, he will carry you through it. He will equip you for it. But sometimes our fears get in the way of really stepping out on faith and following what God's will is. You look at this passage and they said, hey, you're going to meet a man with a jar of water. We may look at that and say, well, that could be all kinds of people with a jar of water. I'm afraid I won't find the right man with a jug of water. I mean, that's not that doesn't seem to be real clear. And so therefore our fears sometimes interfere with knowing God's will for us. Sometimes it's our plans, our desires, our will, our dreams. Well, God, I hear you. It seems like you might be saying that, but God, that can't be right because you know the desires of my heart and what I really want to do is this. God, I really want to marry that person. God, I really want to do this job. God, I really want to go to that college or live in this place. And so therefore, our dreams, our desires, our will, our wants drowned out the voice of God. And we say, well, it doesn't seem to match up with what I want, so that can't be it. Because the Bible says he'll grant us the desires of our heart. We get all that misconstrued. But sometimes it's our plans, our desires, and our dreams. The disciples at times missed what Jesus was doing, didn't understand what he was doing because they wanted him to be king then at that time and throw off the shackles of the Romans and throw off the oppression of even the religious leaders and lead Israel back to prominence. That's what they wanted, and so they were missing. And in fact, as we already talked about, one of the reasons why Judas betrayed Jesus is certainly just that. He wasn't going to do what Judas wanted him to do, and so Judas betrayed him. And then there's distractions in our lives. We fill our lives so full of things that we can't hear, or we're not listening, or we're not leaning in and paying attention to what God is saying to us, and we miss it because... There are things, and again, they're not bad things, children and jobs and, and just life and, and chores, and, but we get the priority wrong and we miss it. And so therefore there are reasons why we don't think God's will is necessarily clear, but it is, and I want you to see this. I want you to see the reason why, and the key phrase here is, over in verse 16, uh, the disciples went forth and came to the city and found as he had said unto them. And so therefore what God says unto you, you can find it to be exactly what God says if you don't allow your fears and your plans and your own desires and your own dreams and your own distractions to get in the way. But number one, okay, so... Again, this is all still under God making his way clear, but I want you to see the reason they, the disciples, found it exactly like he said it would be was because, number one, they stayed close to him. The disciples followed him, traveled with him, lived with him, walked with him, listened to him. Now, we're going to get to that in a minute, but for three years plus, they had been eating and drinking and breathing in their master, their savior, their Lord, Jesus. Leaning in on every word that he was saying. I picture Mary sitting at his feet. I know she wasn't a disciple, but the followers there, Mary leaning in and just soaking in every word he says. But here the disciples, they are listening to him. They are following him. They are leaning in for every word. They are watching every action, every response. Their intent and their priority is Jesus. We spend, this goes back to why we miss it, we spend our time watching TV or reading a book, or playing video games, 
or whatever our hobby is. And you say, I, I can't do those things? No, but how much of your life is taken up with the things like fishing or hunting or cars or shopping or shoes or TV or whatever it is you spend, we spend the majority of our life doing as opposed to focusing on what Jesus has for us. I think we miss it because we're not leaning in on every word. We're not watching every action. We're not intent on him. We're out in our yard making sure our grass looks green or the weeds are all gone or whatever it might be. Those aren't bad things, but they're things that distract us. They spent three plus years every moment taking him in. We spent, you ever want, I started thinking about this. We spend a significant portion of our lives training for what we think we want to do. Give you a few examples, all right? It takes 13 years to get through high school. If you count kindergarten and then 12 years, that's 13 years just to get your high school diploma. 13 years. They spent three years in Jesus Christ University. 13 years to get through high school. 17 years, if you add four more years to that, to get a bachelor's degree. If we go on to college and advanced learning, four more years, 17 years of schooling to pursue what our career may or may not be, but what we think we want to do with our lives. 19 years on average if we want to get a master's, 21 to 23 years for a doctorate, or if we're going to be a doctor or perhaps a lawyer, even more than that. Then, while we're in those jobs, in our occupation, we go to seminars and trainings and meetings to increase and advance our skills and our abilities so that we can live life and pay our bills and go on vacation and raise our children and do all these things that are nothing but temporary. Now, preacher, are you saying that going to school is bad? Are you saying that training is bad? No, that's not what I'm saying. My point is, is that we spend all that time for earthly things. And most of us spend one or two hours a week in the Word of God or church. And we wonder why we miss the clear instructions of Jesus or God. So they stayed close to him. And if we stay closer to him, intent and listening and watching, it will be so much more clear what God wants us to do. Number two, they sought to serve him. Look with me in the verse, and it says, they went to him. Look, look there in verse 12. The disciples said unto him, what do you want us to do? I'll be honest, most of us as Christians, most of our lives, we wait for God to show us what to do. I'm just waiting on you, God. No, they went to him and said, tell me what you want me to do. They did not wait for him to come. Now, there's times that we wait on God. I get that. But are we, it's like, you know, remember, remember when you had young kids and, and you, I, I had this now, they're still young and I'll tell Lucas, whose job is to do the dishwasher. I said, Lucas, you haven't done the dishwasher. He goes, well, you didn't tell me. Uh, some things you just know to do, you can see they need done. And I'm not picking on Lucas. It's all kids are like that way. Clean your room. Well, you didn't tell me to clean my room. Uh, take the trash out. You didn't tell me to take the trash out. No, instead, that's how we are as Christians sometimes, just waiting for God to tell us something. But really, there are certain things that we ought to know where he's already told us. But why don't we go to him and say, God, what is it you want from me? More important than the TV show, more important than my career, more important than anything is that I follow you. What do you want from me today in this moment? Number three thing as far as they... They stayed close to him. Um, 
or they succeeded in carrying out his will is the fact that they sought to serve him. I said that already, but they listened to him. Verse 13 to 15, he gives instructions and they followed them. Now, here's the instructions, and they were clear. We may look at it and say, that doesn't seem like that would be that easy, but he says there's going to be a man carrying some water, a pitcher of water. Now, understand, this is why this was clear, because in that day, men didn't carry pitchers of water. You, we look at this, and we, this is why it's so important that we study the Word of God and we meditate in the Word of God, and we even like study some background things. It was not a common place for a man to be carrying the pitcher of water because, no offense, ladies, there was no women's liberation movement. There was, and again, I'm not against, I'm not saying women ought to, you know, I, I joke sometimes about women staying in the kitchen or this kind of thing. But back then, that's what they did. The men didn't carry the pitcher of water. So to find a man carrying a pitcher of water somewhere, that's typically what the women did. And so therefore, he stood out in the crowd. He was, one, oh, there's the guy carrying a pitcher of water. And he, God knew exactly where he was going to be, and he sent the disciples exactly where they should have been. And there's the man carrying a pitcher of water, and they followed him to where he was going. And he walked into a house, and so they had clear instructions. And they go in, and they say exactly what Jesus told them to say, and they found exactly what God or what Jesus said they would find. And when we are intent and listening and we're spending time close to Jesus and we listen to his instructions, we find it's exactly how he said. But here's the other thing. They obeyed him. They could, you, you can spend all the time you want with God. You can listen to him all you want. But if you don't obey what he tells you, you're not going to find the will of God for you. And you're not going to find it as clear because you didn't do it. They did it. Now, here's the thing I noticed in this. And i got to be quick because i got so much more to get to. They did not argue about who was going to go. He picked two of the twelve. Did you see that? And again, go on down here, and it says, He sendeth, verse 13, He sendeth forth two of the disciples. Now, if Jesus did that today, there'd be some people that say, Well, why are you sending me? Or there'd be people that say, Well, why are you sending him? Well, that seems like that's an important job. I want to do that. Or someone might say, Well, that seems like kind of a mundane job. I don't want to do that. But there was no argument about being too small or too great or why wasn't I chosen or that seems too hard. They just went and they found it just as he told them. So number one, I want you to see that as hard as we sometimes make finding God's will to be, it's really not that hard. Number two thing I see in this passage is this. Godly love is always the answer. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But this, God spoke to me about this. We live in a world that is so full of dissension and division and arguing and fighting and violence and hatred. And I realize that's a curse of sin. I get that. And I realize it's going to be that way until Christ comes and makes all things new and puts it all to rest. I get that. But what should our response be as Christians? We're told to love the Lord our God and love others. Those are the two greatest commandments. And in a world where right now the political turmoil is through the roof, religious bickering is through the roof, things with the border, things with different races, it's through the roof. And if you're not careful, sin creeps in and we become hateful towards those who have a differing view than us or who are opposed to us or absolutely hateful toward us. But what I see here is Jesus showing love to Judas. We talked about him last week and his betrayal. But Jesus chose Judas. 
knowing what Judas would do. Now, he didn't pick Judas because of what Judas would do. Now, to a certain extent, that may be true because in God's foreknowledge, he knew what Judas would do. But he gave Judas every opportunity in the world not to do it. It didn't have to be Judas to do it. Jesus was going to die, but it didn't have to be Judas, except where God knew. It wasn't like some people argue, well, Judas didn't have any choice. It was preordained that he was going to be the one, and so therefore it's preordained that he was going to go to hell. That He was preordained he's going to be possessed by the devil. No, that's not it at all. Over and over and over again, we see the love of God being shown to Judas, being chosen as one of the twelve. Be, uh, Jesus had just washed his feet along with all the other 22 stinky feet that he washed, at least, of the other 11. He Listen, not only that, but he ate with his known betrayer, knowing that he was going to leave the next moment and sell him out. And Jesus, listen, we may not realize this, maybe you've heard this before, but Jesus said, now when we look at the, 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 the pictures of the Last Supper, or when we think about this, or we read about this, we often don't picture in our mind, but we know that John was on one side because he leaned on Jesus. On the other side was Judas. That was the seat of honor. Not only did Jesus choose Judas as an apostle. Not only did Jesus train Judas as an apostle. Not only did Jesus invite Judas to come and eat with him. But he gave him the choice seat of honor next to him. Why? Because he loved Judas. And if we would love people despite the fact that they vote differently than us, if we would love people despite the fact that they act differently than us, if we would, if we would love people despite the fact that they talk differently than us, look differently than us, make different choices than us, I'm telling you, not only would this world be a different place, I'm not saying that all the evil would be gone, but your life and your testimony would be a different thing. Number three, and this is the main point that I want to get to. I only have a few minutes to do it, but I've got so much. And I got so excited when I saw some of these things. And I want you to see some things. And this is why we come to church, I guess. And this is why we need to study the word of God. And this is why we need to even study some of the background stuff. Is because there's more to this than just what you read right here. And that's this. That God took a tradition and made it a worship. God took a ritual and made it a worship. God took the tradition of the Passover feast, which, by the way, we sometimes say, well, don't do things just because they're traditions. Jesus, there's not a problem with doing things because we've done them before. That's not a problem. Jesus did that. Jesus celebrated the Passover. He didn't say, well, that's a ritual. That's a tradition. We can't have that. No, he led in it. But he made it something better, something new, a new supper. We often call it the last supper. Well, it wasn't his last supper, and it wasn't the last supper, and it wasn't the last Passover, but it was the last one that he ever celebrated, so that's why we call it that. But... He made it something new. He replaced the old tradition of Passover with what we call now the Lord's Supper, communion. He changed it, made it better. He was the fulfillment of, of, of what the Passover was a picture of. The Passover had been a tradition for 1,500 years at this point. I think most of us probably know this, but the Passover celebrated the exodus out of Egypt, or specifically the death angel that passes over, and they, would, they, they, were, they were instructed to take a lamb and, and to sacrifice that lamb, then take the blood and mark the doorpost and the lentil, and whoever was in that house, the death angel who was going to kill the firstborn of every family, did not, if you were in the house that was marked with the blood of the Passover lamb. 
It was a picture of Christ who is the sacrificial perfect lamb that was about to go to the cross and have his blood shed and for those who have claimed, been washed, been marked with the blood of Jesus, you're saved because you put your faith in that. They put their faith in doing what didn't seem like a perfectly ordinary thing to do, marking their door with blood. Can you imagine? I just painted this doorpost. I just painted this lentil. I just painted, and now we're going to mark it up with blood. But they did it anyway. They said, because that's what God said do, and that's what I'm going to believe in. And they did it, and the people that were in the house were saved. And so, therefore, what Christ is about to do in dying on the cross pays the price for our sin. But here's the thing. This is why it's better. What he's about to institute is, is better and he changed it to something new a new supper because the Passover supper had been a tradition for 1500 years it was a ritual they remembered what God had done now they were religious in remembering it for the most part most of the Jews were religious in practicing in remembering they had to do it what God had done but it was remembering what God had done in Egypt, for their ancestors, now you can say for the nation of Israel that's true, so by proxy it applied to all Jews, but because he delivered Israel, the nation of Israel, from Egypt, but it was done for their great, 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 great grandmothers and grandfathers. Nobody that was 1,500 years later was alive when the Passover took place, or when the exodus from Egypt took place. Of course we know that. But it was done in Egypt for Israel, for their ancestors, 1,500 years before. But none of them had actually experienced the miracle of what God, with the ten plagues, being the tenth, being the Passover, the the death angel and the Passover lamb. None of them had seen that firsthand. None. They'd heard about it. They'd been told about it. But they hadn't seen it. What Jesus did in the new Lord's Supper is it became not a solely a tradition or a ritual, but an act of worship. This do in remembering me, and specifically remembering, you're going to do this moving forward, remembering what I'm about to do, what's already been predetermined that I'm going to do. And we look back and, at what he had done on the cross. But it's not just a ritual or tradition, it's a worship because it represented what God would do in paying the price for redemption from sin, but also it was a worship in a of what God was doing. I think we know this, but God did save, he is saving, and he will save. He did forgive our sins, he paid the price for our sins, he is paying the price for our sins, and he's going to pay the price for our sins, because we'll have future sins. It's not that he dies on the cross again, he doesn't need to do that, but it's ongoing. And so therefore, this new celebration, this new worship, was not for something that had taken place, it's for something that is taking place. It wasn't for something that happened to people 1,500 years ago, it was something that happens for you and I right now, and for them right then, and for people that will come in future years. It's for them and not something that they heard about and not something that's just told to them, but something that they themselves experienced. It was a worship, not just a ritual. It was not just for Israel, not just for those people in that generation, but it was for all people of all kinds throughout the world, throughout the ages. Whosoever will may come, for God so loved the whole world. And so therefore it was special, it was better, it was new, and it was a worship. Not only did God take the tradition and make it a new worship, but in that Not only did he replace the old with the new, but also he made the practice of the ordinary extraordinary. Or I should say it this way. He generally 
often practices making the ordinary extraordinary. And I know I'm running out of time, but I, I got to get through this here. So I want you to see this. He takes ordinary things, and he has throughout history taking ordinary things and make them extraordinary. Or to use, uh, Lucas says it all the time, to make things that are mid and make them extra. Ella, she does that too. For example, Joseph was a simple dreamer, and God used him to save the known world. Moses was a baby given up for adoption, and God used him to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Gideon was a simple man hiding his food and hiding himself from the enemy and the Moabites, but God used him to start a revolution. David was a simple shepherd boy, the youngest of his brothers, and he became the great king of Israel. Josiah was eight years old when he became king after his father had been assassinated. Jesus was born in a manger in a barn or a cave, to, laid in a manger as a cradle that held the Messiah and the king. Jesus took a boy's lunch and fed the 22,500, or as we commonly call it, the feeding of the 5,000. Took another boy's lunch and fed the 3,000. He takes ordinary things and makes them spectacular. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, 1 Corinthians 1.27 says. You say, well, what things are you talking about? Well, he used the bread and the wine. Now, bread and wine are two ordinary things in the, in the, that the Jews used every day. They weren't spectacular loaves of bread. It was unleavened bread. It wasn't some kind of, you know, focaccia bread, or I'm not even sure I'm saying that right, some kind of fancy marble rye or anything like that. It wasn't something that you went down to the bakery and said, ooh, I want that kind of bread. It wasn't cinnamon loaf. It wasn't banana bread. It wasn't anything that you'd be like, got to have some of that. It was ordinary, plain, unleavened, flat bread. And it was wine, which was a... Again, let's not get no big argument about all that means, but I will tell you this. It was not any kind of special high-dollar wine. It was wine that was watered down, as was common day, but even more so during the Passover because so many people had to have it, and therefore it was diluted wine. It wasn't wine that you go, ooh, that's good. It was watered down. Ordinary, plain things, and he made them a symbol of the spectacular. They represented what he was about to do in becoming the sacrificial lamb. He re they represented, or he represented, the lamb that was slain. And the blood marked in the doorpost, as I told you earlier, allowing the death angel to pass over. And now the Passover lamb is about to be Jesus, the perfect lamb with no sin, no blemish. The fulfillment of the law is the perfect lamb. That didn't have to be sacrificed over and over again as they did Passover year after year after year. But once and for all, for all mankind, whoever was and for whoever will come, whosoever will may come. It was extra. Now, sometimes we make it too extra. And there are some religions, Catholics in particular, that say, well, it actually becomes the actual body and blood. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. I understand that. There's something in Catholicism where they talk about transubstantiation. That's where when you take that bread and that blood and you put it in your mouth, it becomes the actual body and blood of Jesus. And it has to be taken for your salvation. In other words, for the forgiveness of your sins. You have to do that. It's an obligation. But that's not what Jesus said, and that's not what this was. It was a symbol of what he was about to do. And we do it now to remember what he did do and is doing. The taking of communion does not save us or forgive us of our sin. It is a worship because of what he did on the cross and is doing for us in forgiving our sins. It is a worship, 
not part of our salvation. It's not a work, but it is the grace of God that we are remembering. Now, this is the part that I got super excited about. What we don't realize, many of this, is that in Jewish culture, the Passover, there was four different cups that they drank from during the meal. We read this as he took a cup. But there were four cups that he took. Or four cups that they would use traditionally. And again, Sydney, you probably know this because she comes from a Jewish culture. But there were four cups that they used. And the four cups represented four different things or four different promises that God had given. And very quickly, because we're about out of time, turn back. Now hold your place in Mark. But turn back to Exodus chapter 6. And I want you to see where the tradition of these four cups comes from. Because this is what Jews understood. And we need to understand because there's some amazing things when we see this. Amazing things. The first cup was the cup of sanctification. And that comes from when you read six, six, uh, chapter 6 in verse 6 and 7. It says this. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. That's sanctification. Set apart. I'm going to bring you out. I'm called you out. And so therefore it's called the cup of sanctification. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. And it was taken at the beginning of the, and, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this right, the, the siddhar or the, the main part of the meal. When they, before they started eating the meal, they would drink this cup. The cup of sanctification. Then... In the course of the meal, they would drink from the cup of deliverance because it says there in verse 6, I will rid you of their bondage and I will redeem you, out of the, uh, uh, redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. But notice, I will rid you out of their bondage. It was the cup of deliverance. I will rescue you from their bondage. And that was drunk during the meal. So you had one cup before you really started the meal. That was kind of like the marking of the beginning of that, that meal. And then you would drink the other one during the course of the meal. And then there was the third cup. The third cup is the cup of redemption. And we see that there in verse 6. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. That was, they drank that at the end of the main part of of the meal. And then there was a fourth cup that was the cup of praise because in verse 7 I will take you to me for a people and I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And so therefore it was a cup of praise. Now after they had finished the meal and they drank the cup of redemption then they would sing a hymn, a phrase, of worship, of thankfulness. And then after they sang the hymn, they drank the fourth cup of praise. Now, he used the cup. Again, he used bread, he used wine, ordinary things. Cup, ordinary thing. Now, it's more special than you realize because there was four of them, and I hope you understand that now. By the way... The third cup of redemption is the one where he's reading about here. They finished the meal. They've already dipped in the sop. They've already, they're, they're, they're done. And now they're kind of finished the meal, but he's breaking bread and he's drinking from the cup. And he says, this is my body. This is my blood. That was the cup of redemption, the third cup. That to me is amazing that God would take the third cup from a tradition and use it as part of a new supper of worship and it would tie in exactly to what Jesus was about to do. I'm redeeming you through this cup that represents my blood that I'm going to shed for you on the cross. And then, I'm going to come to the fourth cup in a minute, but then they sang a song. And he used a simple song. People sing songs all the time, but this, Landon, was a song of worship, of praise. 
And as they went out to the Mount of Olives, they were singing praise and worship for what God had done. And whether the disciples realized it or not, it was going to be part of praise and worship of what Jesus was about to do. And we look back now, and as we end our Lord's Supper, our communion, we sing a song of praise. Now, since I've been here, we've been singing Amazing Grace. It doesn't always have to be that song. That's not what they sang then, but it's a song of praise, of thanks, of worship. Ordinary thing, but he made it special. And our praise ought to be spe special. But here's, well, okay, let me say this first. I'm done. He also used his believers. And you and I, the disciples, were ordinary, average, everyday people. They were largely uneducated. They were largely rough around the edges. They were largely just blue-collar workers, fishermen in large part. Matthew was a tax collector. There were political zealots amongst the group. But they were ordinary. You and I are ordinary, but he used the disciples to change the world and to spread the gospel to the four corners of the globe. And he will use you and me, ordinary people, and make us extra and extraordinary for his purposes and for his glory. And so therefore, understand, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's worship in praise. It's an act of worship. We're remembering what he did, but also what he's doing and what he will do because we're remembering what he did on the cross and the saving power and the sacrifice that he makes and the leadership that he gives and the strength and the power and the wisdom to use us as he does. And it's not for us to argue about what am I going to do or what's your will. He makes it known, and it's for all of us, whatever he called you to. We may be unremarkable people, but we're special to God and we're gifted by God and so were they. And so has been every person, every believer that has ever been a follower, a believer, a Christian that has served since is they are special to the Lord and they are equipped by the Lord for the purpose that he has called you to. But here's the thing. You are to be an instrument of worship of the Most High God used as an instrument of action on earth below. That's what we are, that's what the will of God is. Now, the specific will, He'll make it clear to us if we just stay close to Him and listen to Him and go to Him and say, God, whatever it is, just show me, just tell me, He will do it. And we can do it with a heart of love, godly love above all else, that we just love people. And we worship him through our remembrance and our obedience. So what about the fourth cup? Look with me. I saw this. And I just, I got so excited. There's a fourth cup that he has to drink. Now they drank the fourth cup. After the hymn. But look with me, if you would, back in Mark. Back in Mark. Let me get there myself. And I'm done once I share this. Mark 14. And it says in verse 25. Now again, he's drinking the third cup of redemption. Instituting the new supper. And then verse 25, he says, after drinking the third cup, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Well, what's he talking about? The marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. The fourth cup of praise is going to be the first of the biggest praise services that has ever been. The first of the largest worship service, the most perfect worship service that ever will be. When we are in heaven as believers gathered around the throne saying thou art worthy and throwing our 
crowns that we receive at his feet as we sit down and eat that marriage supper of the lamb and then he will drink the cup because it is now finished all of it done and so the cup of praise will be drank then so what did, now that to me just got me excited because I'm not going to drink the fourth cup until I drink it in heaven at the marriage supper the, mar- the lamb of the, of, the, of, the, of the bride and the lamb the marriage supper of the bride and the lamb I'm going to drink it then so therefore they didn't drink the fourth cup so what does that mean for us that means that we are to be singing our hymn of praise until that time Our hymn of praise that comes between the redemption, which if you're saved, you've been redeemed until you drink the last cup. Your life is to be a hymn of worship, a song of worship, a song of praise. And you do so by following exactly what he has for you and staying as close to him as you can and listening to everything that he has and going to him and saying, God, what would you have me to do? And allowing him to use you to change our world and to change the world of our young people and the world that we live in for him. Does that mean that we're going to end sin? No. What it means is that we, our lives are to be changed and our testimony is our song of praise to God and thankfulness for what he has done and for what he is doing and for what he will do until we get to the marriage supper of the Lamb and we drink that cup. And then, of course, we're still going to worship him, but that will be, oh, what a day that will be. What a day that will be when finally it's all done and all the tears wiped away from our eyes and no more sin and no more sorrow and no more pain and no more hurting and no more death and no more evil and no more wickedness and no more sin nature and no more achy body in a perfect place and with a perfect God and a perfect body and we sit down. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful or make light, but at that buffet table, the best food you're ever going to eat with our King and our God and our Savior. Oh, won't you let your life be a song of praise all your days and that we would remember every day. But certainly I hope this helps you the next time we celebrate communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, call it what you will, exactly what it's supposed to be. Not a tradition of man, but a worship of God. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us. Oh, God, we're so unworthy. The disciples were so unworthy. Despite the fact that they listened and they followed and they were close and they obeyed. They still were unworthy. God, it's nothing they did, nothing we do. But your love and your grace that you shared up for us and your sacrifice and paying the price of our sin. And God, that we would never, ever, ever look at the Lord's Supper communion again in the same way. But that we would realize it is an act of worship And that we would let our lives sing a harmonious tune of worship to you for the rest of our days. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.